Well, good afternoon. I'm going to speak into the mic because we are recording this. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Jasmine Roberts. I'm a professor at Ohio State University. Um, my colleague, uh, Marilyn Billings, uh, she's from UMass Amherst. And we're here from the Open Textbook Network. Um, it's basically an organization that helps to provide infrastructure and open education programs for your respective institution. Thankfully, here at Roger Williams University, you guys are a new member of the Open Textbook Network. And so essentially, I kind of want to provide this faculty perspective of using open textbooks. Um, I've used OER in my own classroom. I took on the ambitious uh, endeavor <laughs> of authoring my own open textbook, so I can also speak to that experience a little bit. But honestly, guys, I, I want to hear from my faculty, well, everyone, but I definitely want to hear from the faculty in the room in terms of um, where you're at, in terms of your, your pedagogy, some of your concerns about course materials, and ultimately, what do you truly want to get out of this workshop? And so that's essentially going to be the agenda today. Um, for the first half, it's going to kind of sound like doom and gloom because I'm going to be talking about affordability issues and how high cost textbooks kind of contribute to some of those issues. I'm going to try to focus more so on, again, the pedagogical benefits because I think that's where faculty really play a, a larger piece to that. But of course, students matter just as much. And then I'm, I'm talking about open textbooks, open pedagogy. I'll talk a little bit about the library that we provide through OTN and then also the faculty reviews that we so, so, so want from you. So um, just to kind of hear from you guys, I would like it if you would introduce yourselves. Yes, I am that professor. Um, so just your name department, why are you here, um, your level of awareness of OER, whether you have never heard of OER, like what the heck does that stand for, or you've used OER in your classroom, open pedagogy, all of that. So we will start actually right here and then go, yeah, we'll start right here and then go. Yep. Right uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Bob Ingvall. I teach in Justice Studies here. Very good. Um, why I'm here um, is, is a tremendous question, really. Yeah. Um, I like to think I'm open minded about this sort of thing. I've not used OER okay. in the classroom before. Have you heard of it? Absolutely. Okay. I've mean, thought about it. Right. Um, and I understand that you know, many of my, I would like to get my students more engaged mm -hmm. in the process in one way or another, so I guess I'm here. Thank you. All right. Start. Yeah. Okay. Um, Just name department. Okay, so could we I use Could we use the mic for this as well? I'm sorry. Thank you. Because um, <laughs> we're recording. I'm sorry. I I probably should have specified that a little bit more. Hello. Yes, <laughs> so I'm Karen Bellotti, and I. Um, kind of across a number of departments, but I work here in the library on the second floor. I, I'm the director of the tutoring center. I also run the writing center. I teach in writing studies typically. This semester and a couple of semesters, um, I also teach in um, English. Um, and I also um, co-run the Intercultural Leadership Ambassadors, which is the ILA program um, on campus here. and. Those are students um, who uh, come to the university who have significant financial need. Um, and so this is, the textbook issue has been a, um, a constant <laughs> issue. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mirta Ventura. I'm the Instructional Design Specialist. Uh, I'm located at University College in Providence. And I'm here because I support uh, faculty and adjunct faculty members. So. Um, I'm familiar. I've I've studied OER to some degree, but I would like to know what are the most um, burgeoning practices and what I can do to support uh, our faculty. Um, I'm Maya Bennett. I teach in engineering, um, which is a department that relies heavily on textbooks and very expensive, heavy ones. Um, I have a little awareness of OER. I heard um, Lindsay and some other colleagues here talking about it at the Women at Roger Williams conference last spring. And that's what really opened my eyes to this even being a possibility. So I have one senior level elective that I'm trying to implement this in currently. Um, and I would love to have a little more guidance on how to find really great textbooks and not feel like I'm just shooting fish in a barrel, kind of like searching the internet frantically for sources. So that's where I'm at. I'm Adam Moore from the Department of Education. 
Um, and I have tried to incorporate OER um, reading materials into my course. I find I found it difficult to find quality sort of. We're going to talk about that. Some of the textbooks. Um, so for me, in, in my field, is special education. Um, not. I haven't found a lot, um, and maybe it's that, and, and I've worked with Lindsay too to, to help start with that, but um, but certainly I'm trying to in my classes turn classes into more um, open access for students. Yeah. Sorry. Putting me on the spot. We're just doing introductions. <laughs> just name department, why are you here? Um, your level of awareness regarding um, OER. Okay. Um, I'm TJ Satome. I'm with the School of Justice Studies. I'm an adjunct staff for the Social Security program. Um, I guess you all know Doug White, so I work for him. I only have part time. Um, I have a full time uh, job everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of adjuncts have to sort of cobble together. But anyway, um, so. For this particular semester, I'm actually teaching an online-only class. Um, sometimes, I've, I've been with uh, Roger Williams for five years, but the, the evening classes, lecture, uh, online, uh, mix of um, continuing ed, uh, sorry, what is it called now? University <laughs> College, <laughs> uh, UC, and also the traditional students. So we have a mix of those. And what I've actually have found it, uh, challenging is to, you know, have different types of learners to accommodate. You know, lecture only doesn't work for some people. Online only doesn't work for some people. So what is a good medium? Uh, because of the, the, the discipline is cybersecurity, computer programming. So I do a lot of the computer programming courses. So that it itself lends itself for online. There's a lots of online tutorials. Uh, I am basically going to, out to the internet. I guess somebody else, some other speaker said that. Uh, I have sort of curated my own set of good instructions that, you know, whatever the topic at hand that for that at the lo at the right level, I mean, the, the, the finding the right level content for the right audience, you know, at at the right length yeah. is always a challenge, and I have to spend a lot of time. And I, sometimes I just have to give up and just use, you know. Uh, uh, it's Cengage. convenient, yeah. yeah. Cengage already has a lot of programs, uh, workbooks, uh, quizzes, and so forth. So it, I, I don't like to cheat in that sense. Mm -hmm. But I know that they're very expensive. I didn't even know that some of those textbooks cost like hundreds of dollars, yeah. right? Times how many credit hours you have to take. Yeah. And it's, it's it, when I realized that, oh, I better look for something. Alternative. And I, I think last semester is a good example. One student, actually two students, were using the uh, old edition of the same textbook. Okay. And I was wondering okay, why you keep on turning in, you know, these old. They're not. They're not. The, the yeah. even the one edition off. They were different enough that when they're submitting their assignments, they were working on the wrong assignment. Yes. So I kept on saying, "Why are you working on?" And they told me that, oh, I couldn't really afford to take uh, the, 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 the latest version, so I actually went out and bought mm -hmm. the old version. So well, why didn't you tell me that? Because I probably could have got you something, yeah. or you know, uh, I didn't realize that was a problem. So I know that I think a lot of students don't share this with me, but mm -hmm. I think the cost of the textbooks is just prohibitively expensive. Yeah. So I really start to seriously think about that. Then when I heard this, I said, oh, I better do something. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm here. I think that's it, yeah. Sorry, I'm late. No. <laughs> no, you're fine. Oh, like I said, I'm really excited. It seems like this is going to be a really great group. A couple of things that I do want to establish for everyone. Um, oh, I'm sorry, before I get into that. Um, so again, I am from uh, Teach at Ohio State, uh, full time there. But I also speak through the Open Textbook Network. Um, this number probably has changed since we created this little cool infographic. So we have approximately 604 textbooks in our library. And about 2 thirds of them have been reviewed by your respective colleagues. So I think that's a really cool thing. 
Um, okay, so what I'm not gonna be doing in this workshop, I'm not a sales rep, so I've already established who I am and my affiliation, it's with Ohio State. Um, we are not a textbook publisher, so this isn't going to sound like a Pearson, Cengage, McGraw-Hill type of workshop. We're not trying to sell you anything. We're just trying to raise awareness about OER and how that can enhance your pedagogy. And also, on, on that note, I'm not here to bash those traditional textbook publishers. I might mention maybe how they can improve in terms of not gouging prices. <laughs> um, but other than that, I'm really not here to demonize those particular publishers. They do serve a purpose in our marketplace, and whether we uh, agree with that, that's a whole other situation, but I really want to leave space and time to talk about OER, mostly. And then um, you might find at the end of this workshop that OER might not fit into your respective classroom setting, and that's okay. You can at least pass this information along to some of your colleagues. All right, so here's a question that I kind of want you guys to kind of tuck in the back of your head in terms of the course materials that you've been using in your classroom. What are some of the most pressing concerns and or challenges that you or your students have with your current course textbooks or course materials? So just think about that and save that for later. All right, so this is me and my students from a couple of years back. I know I look like one of my students. That's a perk of being a millennial professor. Um, but a part of the reason why I'm here, guys, is because of my students. Uh, this is very personal for me. Um, I remember as a first-generation college student um, at the University of Michigan, a professor assuming that since I was at Michigan, I can afford his $120 textbook, and that was furthest from the truth. And I, I, I remember now, at least as a professor, I, I definitely don't want my students to have that impact or that, not the impact, that um, um, same experience that I had with that particular professor. There was another experience that I had. It was in an investigative journalism class that I took, I believe, my junior year. And it was a great course for the most part. Um, but I noticed there was a heavy weight in that field that was missing from the course curriculum. And this is her, Ida B. Wells. So if you don't know who Ida B. Wells was, um, she was a prolific journalist back in the late 1800s. Um, she was an editor for the Memphis uh, Free Speech paper. Um, she really spearheaded and reframed the conversation about lynching um, in the United States because up until that point it was framed not necessarily in a positive way but not in the way that we perceive it today. And again, I was just really shocked that we weren't talking about her. And so I remember coming to the professor during office hours asking, why, why aren't we talking about this person? And I kid you not, she literally said, well, it wasn't covered in the textbook. I'm sorry. And I just thought that wasn't a good enough reason, you know, to, to leave someone like her out. And again, just kind of hearkening back to that experience, I don't want my students to have that same experience as well. And so as we go through this presentation and as you're reflecting on your own course materials and, and, and what you or how you're selecting those course materials, I want you to think about whose voices, whose experiences are you centering when you're selecting your course materials. And as a result, Whose experiences and voices are you leaving out and consequently marginalizing? And what are some priorities that, or some factors that you use to basically come to this decision? Um, so a lot of people don't know uh, from the uh, uh, United Nations, there's actually language, language embedded that calls for higher education to be accessible and affordable to everyone. And unfortunately, as we know, that's not necessarily the case. In fact, cost has been a factor for so many students. I think it was 2.4 million low to middle income students unfortunately had to drop out of college due to costs. And I just think that's un unacceptable. Um, sometimes this price tag, right, affects students be before they even come onto our campuses. So I'm not sure if you guys have heard of the notion summer melt. It's this phenomenon that prevents, or the cost aspect, I should say, prevents prospective students from coming onto our, our campus. Um, these students in particular come from low-income backgrounds, they're first-generation students, they're transferring from community colleges, and they're coming from minority communities as well. And it's up to 40% of those college-bound high school students. Um, in terms of funding, again, we, use, we, we read the newspaper all the time in terms of the uh, bleak picture of funding for higher education. A lot of the responsibility is being shoved onto the parent or to students to provide funding for their uh, college degree. Here in Rhode Island, it's completely flipped. So there's a lot of pressure for students and their parents to provide uh, financial support for their own um, education. 
Um, in terms of debt here in Rhode Island, uh, as of 2018, approximately, or there's approximately $36,000 um, in college debt. Here at Roger Williams, unfortunately, it's a little bit higher than that state average. And so this brings me to this slide. So unfortunately, I wish I could tell my students that I can provide them with free tuition. Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, we just had the Democratic debates yesterday, and I'm sure they, they talked a great deal about that. <laughs> Uh, room and board, I wish I could provide them with free housing, but what I can control, books and supplies, definitely. And it's really interesting because if you look at this list, I'm going to go back here, books and supplies, I would imagine it's not the most expensive right, item on this list. But again, this is the one that I can control as a faculty member or have the most control over. All right, so what I'd like you guys to do is to actually partner up or get into groups of three for my faculty members, especially um, in the group, and kind of discuss these questions uh, with your partner. So how exactly do you go through that selection process of choosing your course materials? What are some pedagogical priorities that you use to select those course materials? And do you actually ask your students about their opinions about the textbook or course materials? I'll give you guys about three or four minutes or so, and then we can kind of uh, get, to, get back together as a group. All right, so let's go ahead and get back together as a group. I already hear some really great discussions going on. Um, so starting with the first question, so how do you guys select your course materials? Take me through that process. Is it just the content that you're looking at? Colleague who authored it? Cost? Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, are we still using the mic? I'm sorry. When we're okay. Sorry about that. It's 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 for the recording. Yeah. Recording. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. People are gonna look at, listen to this like, okay, guys. <laughs> Cost never really entered it into the picture until fairly recently, as I was saying. Um, but I do have specific course, sort of like a path, learning path for the entire cyber uh, cybersecurity curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's sanctioned by NSA and Homeland Security, so I pay attention to where does this particular course fit into the overall achievement of this degree. Yeah. So I, I kind of start from top down in that sense. Yeah. And of course, I do consult, you know, Doug White, the chairperson. So how did, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he usually says, whatever you think is good is good. <laughs> I trust you. It's like, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, it's good that you have that autonomy. Oh, I have yeah. plenty of autonomy. Yeah. Sometimes too much. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else want to chime in in terms of? I, I, actually, do, I actually do consider costs. Um, not for any altruistic reasons, but simply because I want my students to read the material. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know, based on experience, that sometimes if you, if you tell them this is the book and they look and it's $127, they're that they're not going to buy it. Um, so I try to, you know, I, I, as, I, as we talked about in our small group, I try to incorporate currency and, you know, I'm in a social science, so I can do that. Um, and I can literally say to them, you know, listen, you know, listen, guys, I know this book is $5 used on Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, we could order it now. So, you know, um, so I'm sympathetic to the notion of you can't afford textbooks. I really get that, but not this particular textbook. Mm -hmm. You know, you can afford this one mm -hmm. uh, or this book. $5 textbook, right? I'm sorry? The $5 textbook. The $5. Okay. I know you can afford the $5 one, and yeah. I know you can afford the $7 one. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's do this, mm -hmm. you know, so don't, you know, and if you can't, and I always tell them, you know, come to my office and have a private conversation, and I'll get it for you. You know, we'll figure out a way, but we can't have this excuse of not getting the textbook because it's too much. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, I am incredibly sympathetic to cost, and I do kind of factor it in, um, but it's easy in my discipline. Well, let's move on to the second question. Um, do you guys have any um, particular teaching styles or your own pedagogical philosophy that you're using when you're selecting course materials at all? Can I speak? Um, yeah, absolutely. Of course. So what I always try to encourage people to do is to use something where you can, it's one click almost, where you go to one page and you can find everything. Because uh, with online learning in particular, I find that people create links to links to links, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. students get confused or they get lost. Mm -hmm. And so for me, yeah. <laughs> so for me, I always say to people, if you can put everything on one page, um, then that will create 
in my mind, the least amount of confusion. So I'm always trying to think of, for people who aren't in the classroom, what's the least confusing experience that they can have? Anyone else? I think for me, I try to explicitly tell them that the readings or whatever course material I'm using, we are going to reference in class. And they'll say, like, thank you, because I think that's often something that students have said, like, people ask us to buy these $200 books, and then they don't use them. They just say, you know, read this, but then it's never explicitly referenced. So I try really to explicitly tie in, talk about the readings, have them use the readings, whether it be a journal article or the book that I've asked them to uh, borrow or buy. And then finally, do you guys actually ask for feedback from your students? I'm, sh I'm getting a couple like, yeah, maybe I should do that. You're shaking your head, yeah. How do you how do you do that? How do you ask for feedback? Just at the end of the semester, like a survey? or I, I actually continuously ask um, mm -hmm. all throughout. Every week I actually have a, a online uh, Bridges forums. What would you think about this chapter? Oh, nice. Okay. The Bridges are learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, some, some says... You, Great. Some mm -hmm. says no. I hated it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a difference between you know everybody's learning style. Right. Because unfortunately, with the textbook, it's already fixed. Mm -hmm. You can't fix that. Mm -hmm. if, if you're not mm. a, if you're not into reading. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're bringing up a really interesting point in terms of with traditional textbooks, they are fixed, right? You're not able to with some of them customize them, tailor them to your own respective learning style, your classroom experience. And I think that's one of the promises of at least some OER in terms of you can do that for your students. The students can even do that for themselves. So, yeah. And I did wanted to kind of uh, do a little tangent here. These slides will be provided to you guys at the end of the workshop so you don't have to like hurry and write everything down. All right, so we have already kind of hit on some of these points in terms of from the student perspective, their general dissatisfaction with some of the course materials that we're assigning. Um, the biggest thing that I hear from my students is that they're not seeing how this applies to real life. Or on a bare minimum level, they're not seeing how this applies to their lived experience, their personal experiences. Along those lines, especially my students that are coming from minority communities, um, they're not seeing how this relates to them culturally. A lot of the examples that we don't even know that we're using in the textbook come from a very westernized white perspective. And for my students who are not coming from that perspective, that makes them feel left out of the classroom. Students are able to learn better from an, ex ex an example, excuse me, that's more culturally, socially relevant to their lived experience. Um, I'm sure we get this a lot as well from our students. There's too much jargon. Like, just give me the, the high points, uh, concise, get to the point so I can move on to the application part. I find that a lot of my students are more interested in how can I apply this either to my job, how can I apply this to other classes, how can I apply this perhaps to something that I've viewed in the news. So they're getting so tied up in the jargon to where they don't have time, at least they feel like they don't have time to apply. And last but not least, it's boring. <laughs> Yes, I do too sometimes. Um, I'm going to kind of breeze past this slide because I feel like you guys get the point in terms of high college or high textbook prices. They've risen, oh my gosh, astronomically since 1977, over 1,000%, which is crazy. That's higher than the consumer price index. Um, here is a picture of someone, I believe she's from New York University, so not that far from here, uh, back in 2014, 2015. Uh, these are all her books that she had to buy over a course of seven semesters, and they totaled up to a grand total of $1,400. So and it looks like I'm trying to figure out her major history of medicine, the Communist Manifesto, Oxford Study Bible, Biochemistry, Microbial Disease, something in the science. <laughs> All right, and faculty, we're chiming into this uh, conversation as well. I think we all can agree that textbooks are way too high for students. Um, they're not able to access the textbook because of this cost um, aspect. And as you stated earlier, it might not be in terms of for altruistic re reasons why we're concerned about the textbook cost. It might be because we simply want them to engage with the material, and they can't do that if they can't afford the material. Um, and then students, of course, outside of tuition, the ability to afford course materials is right up there in terms of some of their um, most uh, biggest concern, excuse me, and their uh, biggest challenge. 
Uh, so I kind of wanted to show a clip from students at my university at Ohio State in terms of their perception about high cost textbooks. I always find this video very, very funny because it is refreshing to hear from them and it's also kind of funny to hear some of the responses to this issue from students. I think it's ridiculous. I get most of my textbooks um, through Ohio Link, so a lot of them I can get for free just renting them, but a lot of the language ones I know, like my Spanish textbook, I have to go pay 200 bucks today. I think that there are a lot of good alternatives to getting textbooks. Usually I think they're pretty overpriced, around you know $200 for a Calcura Chem textbook. Um, I know there are a lot of good options like Chegg and other places you can go to rent them or get them for lower prices, but I do think, especially since they're in SSD, that they should be a lot lower. The cost of a new textbook is like over $100, which is ridiculous. And then on top of that, a lot of times they make you like pay for your homework. I think they're too high, honestly. For some classes, like chemistry was just like insanely high just for one class. They're really annoying. They're super expensive and I feel like going to a school with these standards that we're already paying so much for classes but to pay so much for textbooks, it's a really large hassle. I think they're ridiculously high often, especially for biological sciences and other sorts of sciences like that. I've always appreciated when they're not that bad, especially when professors maybe don't even assign textbooks because it can be such a huge waste of money, it feels like. Any other school-related stuff like um, tutoring services or uh, school supplies or just any other living-related things like buying food and stuff. Like, there's a lot of different costs for students living on campus. I've been thinking about uh, doing a study abroad trip, and I would definitely like to be saving some money for that. I could probably like put it more towards like clubs and other things, or even like uh, going out in like town or experiencing like more stuff around campus. I could be using the money towards my rent or towards my food or towards other supplies for those classes. I'm kind of a big nerd, so I'd probably spend that money on books I actually want to read sometimes. <laughs> So I, I love that video because it, it kind of um, illustrates that students are doing value judgments all the time when they're in the classroom. And so this is actually, I actually forgot the university where they did this um, kind of a campaign to raise awareness about the high cost of, of college textbooks. And they had students write on a sticky note and place it on a wall, what could they have spent their money on instead of high cost textbooks? Now some of them are really funny. I'm not sure if you can see it. PS4, right? We have Justin Bieber, video games, trip to Disney, a ukulele, um, vacation to Europe, but some of them are actually kind of serious. Food. Puppies. Yeah, pu puppies, right? Food. Food is coming up a lot. Rent, a decent meal, right? So it's really unfortunate that some of our students are foregoing sometimes food right, just to afford a textbook. I think that's just completely unacceptable. All right, and, and along the lines of value judgments that students are making in order to cope with the cost, they're doing a lot of different things. So uh, one of my friends is uh, an academic advisor at a university that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, and she actually started a, a crowdfunding um, campaign for one of her students in order to help her to cope with the cost. People are going to go fund me right, to um, afford textbooks. I know, right? Um, other things that people are doing, so you kind of mentioned that your students, or I think someone else had mentioned your students, yeah, you mentioned, your students are buying older editions of the textbook, obviously they have, or they run the risk of turning in something that's out of date, not correct, all of that. Um, some of them will delay purchasing the, te purchasing the textbook until they receive a refund check. But what are some academic ramifications to that? So if they're waiting to purchase the textbook, what's going to happen? Yeah, they'll fall behind. Anything else? Especially mm. the Yeah. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Mm hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot more common than what you would think. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they withdraw from class, perhaps, or they just stop coming at all. That's what you're saying. Okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. He felt like it was just, it would be too overwhelming for him to try to catch up and yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, kudos to you for even reaching out to that student because, you know, sometimes professors won't even do that. So, yeah. Um, some students will not purchase a textbook at all. I've done that when I was in college. They share it with other students. But again, what's, what's the implication of that? Negative impact, sharing with other students. Yeah, so limited access. And then around exam time, the textbook gets really, really popular. And I separate this out because um, <laughs> there are legal ramifications to downloading a textbook from the internet. Uh, illegal ramifications, so. Um, and then here, this is a, a quote from a University of Minnesota student in terms of justifying why he did not buy the most recently updated textbook. He said, I figured French hadn't changed too much. But again, I don't blame him for making that value judgment. And then at academic impact in terms of um, you know, uh, the high cost of textbooks, uh, this is from the uh, stu Florida Student Textbook Survey. It was conducted twice, once in 2012 and once in 2016. Um, so two-thirds of students in that survey reported not buying the required textbook because it was so expensive. Some of them will take fewer courses, which affects all of us in this room, especially faculty. If we don't have students in our chairs, in our classrooms, that affects our livelihood in terms of being faculty members. Some of them will earn or um, perform uh, poorly in class, drop the class completely, or even fail. So again, just some academic implications here. And then this quote is from a community college student out of Santa, Santa Ana in California. And I thought this was really, really, really compelling yet depressing. Um, she said, I've had friends and no other students who will change their major. Not because they're not intellectually capable of succeeding in this major, they will change it just because of the cost. And so I was saying this morning, we're losing very capable students just because of the cost. And I think that's really, really, really unfortunate. Um, and now I want to kind of transition into the pedagogy part because I feel like when we talk about OER, we focus a lot on students and as we should, but I also want to make sure that we are incorporating faculty more in terms of the promise of OER put pedagogically. And so what I'm seeing in higher ed in terms of how instructors are approaching the classroom experience, a lot of us have been taught, whether it's by our advisors, whether we saw this in college, to teach to the textbook. So our syllabi is arranged according to the chapter in the textbook that we've assigned. And so for me, at least, I felt like that really limited my autonomy, right, that I had as a faculty member. But unfortunately, we're still seeing that a lot. That's the traditional way that we're approaching classroom curriculum. Um, also kind of hearkening back to the example of how some of our textbooks and course materials that we're using lack cultural relevance to our students and that can enhance this notion that um, the current pedagog pedagogical practice that we see in higher ed lack inclusive teaching practices. A lot of our students are not contributing to that knowledge and content creation. We approach students as these knowledge buckets, right? So I'm the professor, you listen to me, I'm the expert, case closed. Instead of really using students and leveraging their learning experience in terms of viewing them as fundamental contributors to that learning experience, they can spearhead this if you just give them a chance. And then kind of along those lines, disposable assignments, very transactional in nature. So essentially what we do as faculty members, we assign them a term paper or an exam, they get a grade and then that's it. They forget the content. They're not applying it to other classes, they're not applying, to, applying it to their jobs, very disposable in nature. And so I encourage you, especially the faculty in this room, to stop teaching just content. We have to remember that we're teaching people. And one of the things that I've tried to do in my own classroom is to think to myself, what kind of student do I want to come out of the classroom or to, to yeah, come out of the classroom at the end of the semester? And then from there, what kind of skills will help to develop that student? 
And then what kind of course materials will help to enhance those skill sets? And I think if we approach it that way, that kind of relieves us from this very textbook driven course that so often we, we use. And so as you can see, the system that we're currently using is very, very broken. And so OER um, can be one solution to some of the issues that I've talked about, but again, it's not a, a silver bullet, I guess you can say. All right, so going back to this question that I posed to you guys at the very beginning of this workshop, and you, we don't have to split up into groups, what are some of the most pressing concerns that you have with the current, uh, current textbook or other textbooks that you guys have used in the past? Let's, let's move this outside of cost, because we talked about cost a lot. Any other concerns that you have about textbooks, course materials? I know it's hard. <laughs> Uh, my concern is that you know I teach several courses, and how I'm always paying attention to how does that, how do these, how do these courses fit into other uh, subdisciplines or subspecialization that the students might be teaching. Yeah. And when you look at each individual textbook, you know they don't really, you know, I think it, students have tougher time picturing how this particular course content relates to other courses that they're mm -hmm. taking. And you know, I have to really emphasize bringing in real world examples is, hey, this is relevant because of this, this, or this, this. Yeah. But by simply just reading that, there's no, there's no way they're going to get that. Yeah. Right? So that I mean, part, of, part of my responsibility as a teaching staff is to make that connection. Mm -hmm. But I just feel that so many of these textbooks that we have are just you know, stand alone, mm -hmm. disposable, like you mm -hmm. said. That's mm -hmm. a great word for that. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. I'm trying to be... To be fair, I didn't make that up. That was David Wiley. <laughs> just want to put that out there. <laughs> All right. So for Mr. David Wiley. For, the, for <laughs> coining that term. Uh, I, I try not to make in in each individual uh, courses, textbook, assignments, disposable. Yeah. Yeah. They all relate, right, yes. in a professional life. And, and uh, it, it's great when someone says, oh, yeah, I remember you taught me this mm -hmm, in the back mm -hmm. yes. two semesters ago. I actually used it today. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a great thing. Absolutely. Right? Um, that's why we, we teach. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's my concern, mm -hmm. right? There's no big picture, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Absolutely. I was really compelled by you talking about Ida B. Wells because this is a problem in engineering, no surprise, right? Um, it's all a bunch of white men. Um, and I had to change my freshman year engineering course textbook because the first time a woman showed up in the book, it was a naked body of a woman talking about how you design for different sized people. So it's bad, it's really bad. Um, and how are we gonna get better representation in our textbooks? And it's hard to because I mean the representation, the science was developed by a bunch of old white men. That's just the fact. So how do we bring in this like um, relevance to our students? And I don't know if that's happening in engineering textbooks anywhere. But I mean, you can, are able to bring in currency into your course, and there are obviously a lot of engineering things going on, but they're not showing up in our textbooks. So that's a big challenge. Yeah, we're, we're probably like twenty years behind. You know, thirty. Years. So um, the, the thing for me that I see is this kind of um, delay in like we have physical textbooks and then e-books e and then we have uh, learning management systems. So you're trying to get everything to work together and it's very confusing for students but it's also confusing for professors. And so for, for me like the big thing is how do you stream like in thinking about streamlining this process and I think it's still in development but um, the, the easier the better because then it will be such a, a more vivid and robust learning experience for people and I think right now we're stuck in that kind of like weird spot where things are coming together but they don't always work well together. So that's what, I'm, I, that's what I think about with textbooks sometimes. Just to second that thought, you know, if we are struggling, students are struggling. Right, 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 absolutely. We are struggling to use these tools, mm -hmm. and if we are struggling, the students are obviously trying to figure, scratching their head, how do these things right. come together? Right. Yeah. Or times 
I want to go ahead and move on to actually talk about open textbooks. Um, so I'm going to actually breeze past this. Here I was just showing you guys the, and I'm not sure why, I think that happened with Marilyn's presentation <laughs> earlier. But here on this left-hand side, this is the, I guess you can say the traditional model of how textbooks are created. So you have a publisher um, who is essentially going to um, pay people to contribute to this textbook. Um, they recoup the cost through profits and they pay the authors of the textbook through royalties. Um, I've co-authored a textbook and it's always so interesting when faculty members will say, you know, I'll just team up with Cengage or Pearson and make, you know, $50,000. That will not happen. <laughs> I get like a $2,000 royalty check every semester and that's about it. So I just want to put that out there. <laughs> Right, right. Oh, my, see, see, so you can attest to that as well. I mean, no, I really do think there's a misconception when I talk about OER. Some professors are like, well, I'll just write my own textbook and team up with a publisher who has an infrastructure in place, and it's not all, the grass is always greener on the other side. I'll just put it that way. Um, here is the model that we're using in a lot of OER. So we have a foundation or some large source of funding that is going to help with the content creation and overall infrastructure of publishing and creating this, this textbook um, or this open resource, I should say. Um, we do pay people who are contributing to this resource and there's very little cost, if any cost, to students. But we're missing something from this model. What are we missing here? You want to think of it? Yeah. Copyright. So we don't know exactly what or how the user can engage with that material, what they can actually do with that material. And so with open textbooks, we basically um, explain what the user can do through license, open license, I should say, um, that's been created by the Creative Commons. Are you guys familiar with the Creative Commons, nonprofit organization that does a lot of great work in the open, um, just open field, I guess you can say. And so with these open licenses, I think there are about six of them. Um, and they basically, again, tell the user what they can do with this open resource. And so I'm going to uh, quickly breeze through some of the um, license that you will see here through the Creative Commons. CC BY, that's the most liberal of the six licenses that you see here. So essentially, you can do whatever you want to do with that textbook or that open resource as long as you attribute the original author, so cite the original author. CC BY NC, non-commercial, so you can do whatever you want to do with that resource, except for you have to attribute the original author and you cannot make a profit off of that. I'm going to put an asterisk by that because I know there's, I'm not sure, maybe I shouldn't even get into that. I'm not even going to get into that. Okay. CC BY, share alike, so you can do whatever you want to do with that open resource. You have to attribute the original author and you have to license it in the same way that that original author did. So let's say that you're using my textbook, which is a license under CC BY NC. Um, and let's say it's a CC BY uh, share alike, I should say, and you want to edit that textbook a little bit. You want to customize it to your respective classroom experience. It has to be licensed, that derivative, in the same way that I originally licensed it. Um, CC BY NC share alike, that's basically what I just explained. CC BY non-derivative or no derivative, um, you cannot edit it. And then CC BY, non-commercial, non-derivative, that's the most restrictive of the open license. And there's some argument as to whether or not that's truly considered open. Again, I'm not going to get into that conversation. Um, but the, that's the most conservative of the uh, Creative Commons license. Any questions? I feel like I just gave a lecture to my students. <laughs> Correct, CC BY. Do whatever you can. You can make money off of it if you want to. You can edit it. You can redistribute it. You can keep it for as long as you want. Whatever you do to it, you have to attribute the original author. Yeah. Correct. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. What were you going to say? That's a really good question. Ah, 
I, I, I can't really speak to that. I, I know I will say this, in the past couple of years, because what some traditional textbook publishers are doing, they're taking open educational resources and putting a paywall behind it, those that have that CC BY license. So what you're seeing some folks who are authoring open content, they're changing their license from CC BY to CC BY non-commercial. Um, so we're seeing that shift a little bit, but in terms of the most popular, I can't really speak to that, to be honest with you. Coursera used some of the you know, creative content, saying mm -hmm. they are actually making money off of it. Yes. I would assume it's, you know, the EOI can say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Share a line, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. And, uh, and because then we use a lot of open source software in what we do, mm -hmm. part of the things that we have to do is we have to contribute. And if you actually are contributing, you have to contribute back to Source. Yeah. So right. Right. Absolutely. I don't know how it works with the textbooks. So if you actually create them, so they deliver them, mm -hmm. do you have to contribute that? Is that required? Uh, that depends on the exact textbook. Um, you don't have to contribute if you don't want to, but you mo most certainly can. Yeah. All right, so this is the model that we're seeing that a lot of open educational resources use in terms of having a funder in place to help to financially support the creation and infrastructure surrounding the open resource, and that is licensed through a Creative Commons open license. So I wanna make sure that we establish um, a couple of definitions here in terms of what I mean by open. Oftentimes, including myself, before I got into this whole open education, OER conversation, I thought open was synonymous with digital resources. And that's not necessarily the case. So it's not just anything that you can find online or on the internet of that sort. Um, I'm gonna skip past that. Oops, I'm so sorry, guys. So it's the permissions part that I find really, really fascinating about OER. So it's not just the free argument that you see a lot of OER folks um, engaging in. It's basically the permissions that are enabled through this open license. So as a user, I can keep this open educational resource for as long as I want. There's not a paywall that says to me, for example, as a student, as soon as I leave this class, I can't access this text or I can't access this homework uh, packet. I can customize it to my own respective learning experience. So I can remix it perhaps with other materials that are also openly licensed. As soon as I remix it, maybe I wanna share it back out to the general public so I can redistribute it. I can reuse it to my liking and again, I can edit it. Especially if I find something in there that maybe is um, not as accurate as it could be or again, isn't as relevant to my particular context, okay? And so as you can see, these are called the five R's of OER. Um, one of the gurus in the open education movement, David Wiley, who I mentioned earlier, um, he came up with this really cool way of remembering the permissions part of open education or OERs. All right, so I wanna, again, kind of circle this back to faculty in terms of what I hear from my colleagues and when I talk to other faculty at various institutions, their concerns about open textbooks. So the number one thing that I hear from faculty is quality. Quality, quality, quality. How are we vetting the content and the accuracy of this particular open textbook? And I will say there are some open textbooks out there that are not great. Just like there are some commercial for-profit textbooks out there that are not great. Um, there are some open textbooks that are in fact peer reviewed or reviewed by your respective colleagues and there are some that are not. So it's a wide range of quality that you're gonna get as you would see with a textbook that was published by a traditional publisher. Time, so I also hear this a lot from my colleagues. I don't have time to look at all the resources that are out there in reference to OERs. And I kind of said that this morning in terms of, I find that interesting. I'm not trying to tell people what they should do with their time, but I know as a professor, I get some breaks here and there. I get a summer break, I get a winter break, and I think we can use some of that time, or at least we're supposed to use some of that time, to reflect on our courses and think what's been working for our students and what hasn't been working for our students. So again, I think that's one way that we can kind of get around that time um, argument there, time barrier. 
Now, this one is very, very difficult, right? So lack of infrastructure, or lack of institutional support. I get that a lot from colleagues who are at other institutions. They say, Jasmine, you were really lucky. Lucky You had a grant to support your OER adoption project, your OER creation process. And absolutely, I was very, very, very lucky. Um, another thing that we're seeing here at a lot of institutions, this doesn't count towards T&P, their tenure package. And that's a true concern. And I know we're having conversations about this at universities nationwide. But nevertheless, that's a serious barrier that we have to consider when we're trying to get faculty to at least look at open textbooks and adopt them in their own respective classroom. Um, I think you had talked about how you've already looked at open textbooks in your uh, particular area. And they're not really that relevant. And so we, we get that a lot as well. Um, of course, you can customize and edit it to your liking. But again, that goes back to the time aspect that I just talked about. So, And this last one here, I feel like we do not talk about this a lot in academia. We don't like to share our stuff. We like to share it with our colleagues, right? The same five people that are in our respective field. But we don't like to share that out with the public. There truly is a fear of sharing in academia. It's something as, as simple as a syllabus that we don't even want to post online because we're afraid of being ranked in some capacity. We're afraid of the perception, right? So I think that's another factor that we definitely have to consider in this conversation. Any other barriers that you guys can think of, faculty? This is a pretty exhaustive list, right? No. <laughs> So uh, going back to tenure and promotion, does this count towards anything? This reward system that we have in academia, if, you know, if it's not helping my research, if this doesn't count towards tenure and promotion, if this isn't going to go on my CV in some way, I don't see the point of it. And not only that, the incentivization of adopting OER. Outside of a grant, a lot of faculty members are still like, this is, this is great, but I don't know if I'm really motivated to. So yeah, having that support to really adopt it. And for those who are ambitious like me, who want to create an open textbook, that can be even more of a concern. You know? Yeah. So my question is the exposure or um, marketing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Yeah, I can speak to my personal experience. So it was really important for me that I wasn't writing this textbook just for my students. I really was thinking about this in terms of from a global audience perspective. And so I submitted the textbook to the Open Textbook Library um, so that other faculty members could see that this is available. Other uh, repositories, other places that host um, OER. So I think that would be a good place to start. Um, I actually, let's see another thing I did. Oh, I attended open education conferences to talk about my experience. And so that's a very kind of like already natural thing that faculty members are doing, presenting at conferences. Um, so that would be one thing that, another thing that faculty members can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other, yeah. What about the lack of uh, infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does. You got to take them through that process, right? right. So, you know, in terms of adoption, mm -hmm. thinking in the big picture, I think we need the infrastructure to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if my my support people in the room can kind of speak to that a little bit in terms of the um, Roger Williams context a bit. Yeah. So I think. <clears throat> It's really easy for me to help you with adoption. If you just want to adopt a textbook, I can help you find that resource, show you how to embed it in Bridges. It gets a little trickier if you say, I'd like you to help me revise this textbook and customize it, um, which we can certainly do. We have the technology to do that, but we don't necessarily have like the manpower and the resources yet. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of institutions are kind of grappling. We're at that step where faculty are engaged and they want to do this work, but we need the actual resources to do it. No, be a problem, be, be an agitator. I feel, like you, I feel like you potentially undersold the notion of sharing syllabi and things like that. 
particularly in this day with the increased adjunctification of the professoriate, the death of tenure, the, you know, the needs, the desires of a lot of institutions, hypothetically, to get rid of tenure track faculty, to replace them with contingent faculty. So why, what interest, what interest would there be in full-time departments making syllabi super easy so that we could be replaced with adjuncts and farm out all of our work and our intellectual property that way? I know that's not the intent, um, but it just seems as a full-time tenured faculty member who sees you know, the death of tenure probably in my lifetime if I live a little longer, um, why should full-time, if we truly believe sincerely that tenure is a good thing, that full-time professors are good things, why do we want to contribute to the death of it? No, I think that's, that's a good question. I, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't really have an answer to that question. I think it's, it's, it's very compelling. Um, I'm not sure if I personally agree with the whole um, death of tenure um, argument there, but... Yeah, no, no, you're not, you're not. But I think that's a really, really good question. I, I truly do. I don't know if anyone else, I just wanna, yeah. I don't think this really answers your question, but I think there just has to be a culture shift in academia because yeah. sharing is a taboo thing. We don't do it, we're not rewarded for it. So I think that shift has to really come from the administration. Um, I think there needs to be language in the contract that supports creation, faculty, Support of OER stuff like that. So these, all of these dominoes have to kind of fall into place. I don't really know how we do that, but yeah, it's a valid concern. Right, right. And like you were saying, that's going to take some some time. Absolutely. I mean, anything in academia takes a long time to to change. So, but I, I appreciate you bringing up that point. Anything else? I just want to make sure. All right, um, in terms of why some faculty members choose to use OER in their classroom, so they feel like it really facilitates that free exchange of information that we kind of hit on a little bit earlier. It enhances this faculty autonomy um, that so many of us love in this room. So instead of selling our knowledge to a traditional publisher, we can take ownership of that content because we are the experts like you were just talking about earlier. I'm the expert in this classroom. Um, and then also, a lot of the OERs that we're seeing here, at least some of the new ones, have been authored by your colleagues, by higher education professionals from um, very, very highly ranked institutions, such as MIT, Brown University, Harvard, and so much more. All right, so finally, Open Textbook Network Library. So um, what we're asking you to do at the end of this workshop, not at the very end, um, but at some point in time, before November 28th, uh, to review a textbook that's relevant to your uh, uh, particular discipline out of the Open Textbook Library. Um, this is powered through the Open Textbook Network. Um, we have, like I said, almost or probably over 605 textbooks. Uh, the website, again, I just want to make sure that you guys have that, open.umn.edu. And then if you were to go onto the website, you will see that there are a variety of subjects um, here. And then also the cool thing about um, each particular entry for each textbook is that you have the table of contents. Once you actually click onto that textbook, you have the different um, files that this textbook or that you can access this textbook through. You can also see the license of the textbook. And then again, that lets you know as the professor what you can use or how you can use that textbook. And then you can also, excuse me, you can also see some reviews from, again, colleagues, folks that are in your field. All right. I just want to pause here. Any questions? No. Okay. All right. In terms of submitting to the Open Textbook Library, we do have a couple of requirements here. So um, this particular resource needs to have some type of portable file. So in other words, you need to have the ability to download it. It has to be a complete textbook or a complete resource of some sort, so no drafts or anything like that. Um, also anthologies, we try to stay away from anthologies in the Open Textbook Library in terms of um, hosting those. Um, it has to be in affiliation with some type of higher education institution or scholarly society. Um, it has to be what we call original or new work. 
And then it also has to be used to support some type of course, again, at a higher education institution. And it goes without saying that it has to be openly licensed and that includes images. You can link out videos. That's a question sometimes I'll get from faculty members, especially those who want to create OER. So you can link out videos from YouTube, but you can't embed it in your actual text. So I also wanna make sure that's clear. Yeah. Uh -huh. Actually learn something from the IP lawyer at Creative Commons, you can embed videos in open textbooks. Good, yes. Good, good. Well, I, I do have a question. Um, for my course, I often annotate the actual textbook yeah. with using Panapto. You know, I'm actually doing things with multiple screens, mm -hmm. and I'm actually doing the, the code samples and, and commenting, mm -hmm. you know, just blabbering on. Yeah. So, so that's. I, I typically have like five, 10, 15 minute short segments and mm. I'm actually embedded in my, my, my coursework, mm -hmm. right? So if I were to use those resources, how would I do that? I don't, I don't know if you can, I'm so sorry. I don't, I, it's not, I, meant, it's not no. meant for open use, but it's for, the, for my students. Oh, okay. That's a really good question. So you create. I, I've, I've customized. So I would have, you know, a, a PDF portions of whatever it is, and I would insert a link and say, okay, watch this. If you, this is not clear to you, mm -hmm. here is my comment. You know, for those people who get it, they can just skip it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's, you know, it depends I, what I was, right, I was told that, you know, having to use short videos, you know, five, ten minutes, you know, just, the millennials, whatever they, they used to used to using. I think it's Gen Z now. <laughs> Gen Z, whatever it is, you know, they're used to using short videos. Right. So I, I, you don't want to like, you know, record fifty-minute rec lectures. Yeah. So that was my question. I don't know. We can chat after. So Marilyn, like did you? Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, how many of you guys have heard of OpenStax in the room? So they're um, out of Rice University. They produce a lot of open textbooks. They're one of the more popular open textbooks in the marketplace. And what I really appreciate about OpenStax is that um, their textbooks provide a lot of support, a lot of ancillary materials that are on my next slide here. Um, so this is some of the ancillary materials that you might see from this particular textbook, the physics one. Yep, just want to make sure. Uh, these are for students. And then on the next slide, ancillary materials for instructors. And that's another barrier that I see um, from instructors, college professors. That's great, OERs are great, but they don't have ancillary materials. And we're actually seeing more and more OERs come out with ancillary materials. It's not at the level that I think we would like it to be, but it is coming. So definitely be looking out for that. All right, so OER is definitely making an impact here in the state of Rhode Island. You guys' as governor is um, most certainly on board with many open textbook initiatives. In fact, this one here, and I, I believe you guys, have you guys hit that a million mark yet? Or Okay, well, see, this is even outdated. This was from, I think, yeah, yeah, that's really, really amazing, so... And so you guys are also at your respective university doing some really, really good RER, OER work, excuse me. Um, so here, this is a textbook from one of your colleagues at Roger Williams University um, in the Open Textbook Library. Mm? Okay, very good. Another one from Dr. Paul Webb, and he's in which department again? So again, some of your own colleagues are definitely contributing to OER content. Um, Dr. Heather Maselli, she's a course science instructor, and she's really interested in terms of what she's using in the classroom. And I don't know if, Lindsay, you can kind of speak to that just a little bit, because I feel like you can explain it a lot better than me. So Heather um, is one of our OER fellows, and she's been with us for two years in this project. And she basically said, I want to know what an open textbook in core science would look like written by core science students. So she's having the students write the textbook. Um, it's openly licensed, so 
each new semester when she gets a new cohort of students, they evaluate what's been created and then they contribute more. They fill in the gaps, they revise the research, they update it. So it's really, it's been a really neat process. But Lindsay, doesn't that adulterate the content or the, uh, the quality of the textbook? No. <laughs> But again, I understand in terms of open pedagogy, and I'm actually gonna go ahead and move, oh wait, maybe I should talk about this. But open pedagogy is essentially OER enabled pedagogy where you're really engaging with that permissions piece of OER. And it, it's a radical approach to the classroom experience because it's no longer this notion where again, students are knowledge buckets. We are actually using students as content creators. It's user generated content. And for some of us in the room, that's scary. And in fact, it might be like, oh, I'm not doing that with my students. Uh, but it, it's, it's really cool to invite students into that process. But kind of going back here in terms of the impact of OER on teaching. So this data is from a couple of studies that I'm pulling from here. So I remember when I was authoring my own open textbook, one of the things that I found, I guess you can say empowering was again that I was more intentional about my teaching practices. I couldn't just hide behind this textbook that my department had said, yeah, go ahead and use that. And I couldn't hide behind the chapters that were provided in that textbook. I had to think really, really strategically and intentionally about that process. And that I believe, uh, firmly believe actually, that was due to OER. And then in terms of collaboration, I know that there's a colleague of mine at the British, Institution, British Columbia Institute for Technology out of uh, Canada. She and I have kind of collaborated to produce an edition of the textbook that I originally authored so that it's more applicable to a Canadian context. And I probably wouldn't have been able to do that through a traditional textbook. And again, going back to that faculty autonomy, I no longer am kind of written to this particular textbook that someone told me to use. I can do essentially what I want to do or what I feel like is most beneficial to my students. And speaking of the customization promise of OER, here are just a couple of examples. So I wanna talk about Pressbooks a little bit. Pressbooks is essentially the platform that a lot of OERs live in. It's uh, powered by WordPress. Super easy to use for the most part. That's where my open textbook, um, or that's the platform I'm using to create my open textbook. Um, Pressbooks has this really cool feature where you can clone a Pressbooks books. So all you have to do is go into the back end of Pressbooks Copy and paste the link to the textbook that you wanna perhaps modify or remix with another material, and it'll copy that entire textbook for you. And some of my colleagues who have done this at Ohio State, they love, 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 love this feature. So, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Oh, no, no, no. And I'm not saying, and I hope you don't get that impression from today's workshop that I'm trying to encourage everyone to start from scratch and go ahead. Do your own, <laughs> he's like, no, <laughs> that's not it. In fact, it's, if I had to do it all over again, to be honest with you, I probably would have started at that place in terms of remixing it with another material instead of starting from scratch and authoring my own uh, open text because it's a lot of work. It's definitely a lot of work. Oh gosh, I was Speedy Gonzalez. So it took me four months, but I wrote pretty much every single day. And that was over the summer, with the exception of weekends, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty intense. Rewarding at the end of the day, nevertheless intense. Yeah. All right, and here, can you guys see this okay? Yes, so here's just a quote from, again, a faculty member, um, kind of attesting to some of the benefits of using OER for their particular classroom experience. Um, the key words that stick out to me here is that this professor was able to customize the text manipulate it to their liking, and more importantly, making it relevant to their students. And I know I've said that a lot, but again, moving away from the cost savings argument, because I feel like we, we already know that, okay? Um, what is it in for us as faculty members? How is this going to enhance the learning experience of our, our students? That's what we need to kind of focus more on in terms of talking about OER. I'm gonna stop here, pause, are there any questions so far? All right, for those, oh, go ahead. I'm just curious, sorry for always speaking. Um, 
Last semester, actually this semester also, I'm doing a little bit of an experiment of my own where I asked, I, you know, I, I did the, I'm sure you've heard of this sort of a, what is it, upside down mm -hmm. curriculum. Flip, flip. Right? Classroom. Flip, flip mm -hmm. classroom, you know, I don't lecture, mm -hmm. right? I will give them the introductory material, have them read it, come back to the class and we'll do the labs. Yes. With online, you can't do that, no. right? Where, but whereas I'm actually asking as a part of an assignment to have each student to do a video recording of mm -hmm. a particular topic and have, have them teach me. Mm -hmm. okay. Show me that you have understanding because learning how to teach it, right? Yes. Force you to learn the subject mm -hmm. matter. So I, I did that. Okay. Show me, you know, 15 minute video on this particular topic. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. How would I do something like that, you know, where they can either write it, or video record it, or do something, mm -hmm. incorporate it into those. Yes, absolutely. I think that's possible. I'm, I'm still a little hesitant to speak to that only because that's not my respective expertise. I'm not sure if anyone else can. Yeah. yeah. So we were talking about this um, yesterday, and there's um, from there's interoperable features within Pressbooks. It seems like where yeah. there will be this potential to add features like that. So this is where I was talking about the course management system versus the open textbook, because the course management allows you to do that right now, um, system, course management system, but the textbook seems like it's heading in that direction also. So there's kind of like a, they're heading in the same direction with different yeah, I mean, features. I would like personally to have some sort of a, a seamless blending of the open text and the learning management. I don't want to replace learning management Grade books and a lot. That's other features that I'm adding in open textbook, but I don't want the students or I to be managing multiple platforms. Right, that's a bit right. confusing. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think there is an option where you can embed open, especially textbooks that are through press books, embed them through your LMS. And so that's also an option to where like it's streamlined a bit. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, realistically. I was just reading yesterday that there is um, um, a potential feature where you can ha embed like chat rooms and things like that within different systems. So it will, but I'm not sure if it functions within this at this point, but as it evolves, I think we will get to that point. For those who are interested in modifying or editing a current open textbook, not starting from scratch, um, we do have a resource for you through the Open Textbook Network. Actually, it's available for anyone. If you just simply Google this, there's a PDF um, that essentially takes you through that process of modifying an open textbook, especially depending upon the file that it, it, it's used in. Um, I'm not going to say that it's easy right, to modify an open textbook. It really depends upon the file that you're working with. Um, but you do at least have this resource for you to kind of take you through that process. And it seems like you guys have the support here at Roger Williams University to also help you with, with editing uh, or modifying, excuse me, an open textbook. And then for those who really are just like, I want to author my own open textbook. Uh, we also, you guys are laughing as if I was crazy to do that. Um, there's also a resource available for you guys um, that are truly interested in authoring your own open textbook. And again, that's simply stated authoring open textbooks through the open textbook library. And this PDF is available in my slides. So again, Lindsay will forward this information to you all. All right, and the last thing I want to talk about, um, second to last thing, open pedagogy. We kind of discussed this earlier. It's OER-enabled pedagogy, where there's more emphasis on the student or the user contributing to that content creation process. It kind of disrupts the model of expert student or teacher student model um, and more enhances that community um, um, model in, in a university setting. Um, here are some examples of open pedagogy projects. I'm just going to show you guys a clip from this um, webinar uh, that kind of talked about a project that attempted to use open pedagogy. And it's actually easier than I think some faculty members might think. So I'm going to go ahead and, yep. 
And it's starting, this particular part of the webinar, um, this individual was just talking about a project where a professor used a student to um, modify a textbook that um, he was using in the classroom. But I think that another thing that goes along with accessibility or ease of use is, is the information easy to understand? Can students digest it? Will it stick with them? Um, and I think that our team has done a pretty good job of that. We worked on a water technology textbook, Water 32. Um, and sure, actually, we're going to try to pull it up right now. Great. So this is our textbooks page. And this is our water tech textbook. So I wanted to actually show this page first because this is a diagram that was created in Photoshop by a former COC OER assistant named Natalie Miller. So for this water tech textbook, there needed to be a visual diagram of a water bank. However, at the time of this textbook creation, no water bank diagram existed that was openly licensed. So uh, Natalie had some tech background, some tech experience, and she went into Photoshop and created this uh, diagram specifically for this textbook. And that's, I think, what I'm really trying to get at when I say ease of use is that this student collaboration in OER, when, when, when students at a community college get to work with community college professors, we get this cool kind of collaboration where people from a tech background or an English background or a history background, they bring their skills to the textbook. And yes, the professor is writing the content. The content is definitely coming from the professor but the COC student can bring in a tech skill like this and create something that is very unique and very specific for the COC students that are going to be reading this water technologies textbook. Pause it there. General thoughts about that. Some of you guys are like, yeah. Some of you guys are like, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you're fine. I think it's extremely exciting um, in, in terms of advancing education and what students can do uh, to show that they are learning. Um, I think one of the 21st century skills is going to be this idea of creating and um, synthesizing all of your knowledge uh, to create this, these transformative items. And I think that this is just an example, and it's really exciting. And it, 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 makes, sorry, it makes students more intentional, I think, about their learning experience as well. I just want to go ahead, uh, some, uh, I'm sorry, professors have even empowered their students to create to, or to empower them to create test bank questions. That's uh, also another popular open pedagogy project. Um, I'm not going to get into detail about that for time's sake. Um, but again, going, going back to that intentionality, um, students are having students think really carefully about what constitutes a good exam question. Um, I think that's fascinating, so. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and breeze past this in terms of talking about the efficacy of uh, OER in terms of the impact that it's had on students' academic performance. So there's a meta-analysis, and I believe there's actually another one that's in the works, um, took 13 peer-reviewed studies uh, basically examining the efficacy of OER. So essentially, what kind of impact is OER having on our students? Within this meta-analysis, it looked at almost 120,000 students. That's a lot of students that we're talking about here. And then this meta-analysis found that for students who used OER in the classroom, uh, they had the same or better outcomes compared to students who were in classes that used traditional textbooks. So I think my point that I'm trying to make here is that research shows that we're not putting our students to a great disadvantage when we're using OER. And I think that's a really legitimate concern that we have as faculty members. If we're using OER in the classroom, free resources that are not peer-reviewed in the traditional sense, Am I really adulterating that quality here? Am I really having a negative impact on my students' academic performance? And again, a lot of research is showing that that's not the case. Um, there's this really popular study out of the University of Georgia that looked at the impact of using OER to at-risk students. So you guys can see here um, from this study, for students who used OER in the classroom, um, they performed better. Um, there were lower Ds, or reported Ds, Fs, and uh, withdrawal rates. And this particular impact, I'm not sure if you guys can sense this here, was particularly prominent for Pell-eligible grant students. 
So again, the ones that are most at risk to drop out of college if it had not been for some type of financial assistance. Yeah. Why do you think that is? In terms of? Access. I can access that material from day one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can. So in other words, when I'm assigning OER in my classroom, I'm leveling the playing field. And I'm not in some implicit and unintentional way telling a student that they don't belong in this classroom because they can't afford this $120 textbook. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then here's some open-ended feedback that you can kind of read to yourself. A bit about banter. <laughs> General thoughts. What are some key things that you guys pull out from this quote from a student? Any key ideas? I, I have to agree with that. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a different climate. It's a very different climate from when we were in college. Right, 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 absolutely. So. All right, so what can you all do in this room? So we would love if you take a look at a textbook that's in, again, your respective discipline um, for your particular class. We're not asking you necessarily to adopt, that would be great. But um, just take a look at what we have in the Open Textbook Library. Um, of course, if you do adopt uh, a textbook through the Open Textbook Library, we will be really, really happy about that. Um, but if you decide, hey, this isn't really for me, thank you so much for coming uh, from Ohio, Jasmine. But yeah, I'm not sure if this is for me. At least talk to your colleagues about this because we're, even though I feel like more and more faculty members are at least somewhat aware of OER, I still think that they conflate OER with digital resources. And so if you can maybe communicate to them that it's not just that, you know, you through that open license, you are able to do a lot of different things um, uh, through this resource. So uh, we would really appreciate if you could at least say that to some of your colleagues. And then I think Lindsay can kind of speak to this a little bit more, but you will be receiving an email with a link to review um, the textbook that you've been assigned to review. Um, the review is uh, with an open license. Your name will be on the review, as you guys might have seen when you looked at the open textbook library. So make sure you check for spelling, grammar, <laughs> and punctuation. And as a result, um, for a token of appreciation for you guys taking out your time and resources to do this review, there is a, a stipend for that. So, Ooh, where do we get the funding? That's a great question. A lot of different places. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, and, and again, I think this is becoming more and more of a priority. Um, and I'm not trying to go through the doom and gloom rhetoric here, but we are in this bubble in higher ed. At least I believe we are. And that bubble is going to burst pretty soon if we don't do something proactively about some of these issues as they relate not only to costs, but the actual classroom experience that our students are having. I think in general, as a society, we are making constant value judgments about the role of higher education, right? And so I think a lot of funders, a lot of people are trying to proactively figure out a solution to some of these issues that we're seeing, to answer your question in a long-winded way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're always questioning the value of our education. Yeah. Why am I paying for this? Right. And I don't blame them. Right. I don't blame them. I don't have an answer for that. Right. I can make the course experience better for them. Yes. Mm-hmm. I don't know I can do. Mm -hmm. the educational value mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when you know higher education is supposed to enhance social mobility, and oftentimes, depending upon the background that you come from, that can actually exasperate 
social mobility a lot of times. So yeah, going back to, they're, they're constantly asking those questions. Why, why, why? And I actually find that really refreshing about students in general. They're holding us accountable to making this make sense to them, if that makes any sense. So, All right, and so I just kind of want to leave you guys off with, um, with this quote here um, that I was uh, asked a question from a reporter at the Columbus Dispatch, the major newspaper in Columbus, Ohio. And she wanted to know, basically, if I could sum up uh, why OER, in my opinion. And so this is essentially what I said. I said, if you're unaware of OER, know that this isn't just a textbook issue. Um, I love, love, love OER because, of course, it can address that student-centered learning that we're supposed to be all about, enhances faculty autonomy, and it can address some of these institutional issues that we're facing in higher education. And so I had a lot of fun with you guys. If you have any questions at all for me, um, just come talk to me after the workshop. Here's my email address. If y'all are active on Twitter, I am. Uh, you can tweet me or um, any form of content that you guys are most uh, um, used to using, go ahead and do that. So thank you so much, I appreciate it. <laughs>